Greetings, Rick Winston, my fellow Americans. My name is Jim Higgins. I've been in Vermont for about 40 or so years, teaching, community organizing, journalism, uh, and most recently, editing. And most recently, I'm part of the editorial team that massaged Rick's book, Red Scare in the Green Mountains, Vermont in the McCarthy Era, 1946 to 1960. And today, I'll be interviewing Rick about the uh, nature of this book, what started it in his mind, and what's in it. Uh, I first met Rick, by the way, about 45 years ago uh, when he showed up at the Plainfield Co-op upstairs and did a one hour long Scott Joplin rag concert. Oh. Which is when I realized this may be a, a true Renaissance man, because <laughs> I knew he had other strengths. Uh, the book that he has uh, written is published by Rootstock Publishing, based in Montpelier. Uh, the book is due out in July. And Rick is, uh, along with his wife, Andrea Sirota, the founder of the Savoy Theater here in Montpelier. And also, more recently, since he sold, they sold the theater, a teacher, organizer, and musician, and about six other things. Uh, so, I have here in my hand, to quote Joseph McCarthy in Wheeling, West Virginia, when he announced flashing a sheaf of papers that had no names on it, but uh, he claimed 205 American names are on it, who were communists in the government. But I do have in my hand a real document that is uh, a list of 11 questions. Oh, I thought you were going to say 205. Uh, I could get I could up for that with follow-up questions. And I'll start. But first, a little quick capsule. The book is a description of nine rather disturbing incidents that happened in Vermont during the McCarthy era. Uh, it's also a profile of some uh, rather remarkable uh, and colorful characters. Some uh, good guys and some less than good guys. Uh, I was astonished to learn, for example, that the Putney School was part of an extensive FBI investigation, primarily aimed at the founder, founder's um, children, who uh, had a love affair and lived in uh, Red China, uh, wrote books, and uh, that got him on the A-list with the FBI. Uh, the Alex Novikov firing from UVM is in there, a famous uh, example of a purge of a fellow who had 20 years prior some um, me a membership in the Communist Party, and uh, but was active in trade union organizing with the, uh, his colleagues. Uh, I learned that in Bethel, Randolph area, there was a massive cluster of Reds, so-called Reds, uh, Owen Lattimore among them. He is the one who single-handedly, according to McCarthy, lost us China. Uh, and another character that we should all know about is Senator Ralph Landers, who um, was part of the takedown team on McCarthy in the U.S. Senate. So. Getting right to the questions, Rick. Uh, researching, writing, public speaking on this subject has been a decades-long mission uh, for you. One that includes organizing Vermont, co-organizing a Vermont conference in 1988 in Burlington. Uh, tell me, what makes Rick run down this particular road? Is this purely personal? beginning with your parents, um, life-changing encounter with the Red Hunters. Uh, is that your prime motive power here, or is your mission um, more of a present-day political crusade, mm -hmm. independent of that family upheaval? Mm -hmm. I, I don't think of myself as a crusader, but let me go back to that 1988 conference, uh, which was in Montpelier, by the way, up at Correction Vermont College. Here. Um, I've always had an interest in this period, going back to my parents, uh, who are both New York City school teachers, 
active union members of the teachers union. And also, uh, like many of people of their generation, uh, especially children of immigrants, uh, active politically in the Depression and Communist Party, what I think of as rank and file members. Uh, they were very threatened by the McCarthy era, the Red Scare. I'm using those terms interchangeably, but it has to be noted that McCarthy's rise and fall only took up five years. And the McCarthy era uh, expands on both ends of that chronology. Um, so my father lost his job teaching. Uh, my mother was threatened with the loss of her job, but through uh, an accident of chronology. By the time they got to her, things had changed just enough so that she continued to teach till she retired. So I started learning about this when I was a teenager and asking them questions about what they had been through. I was coming into my own political consciousness. Um, so um, always been fascinated by the period and its um, all its currents and cross currents. Uh, I met um, people my own age, teenagers, whose parents were way more involved than my parents were. Learned quite a bit from them. Uh, actually started out in college as a history major, uh, thinking I was going to pursue something in that area, but uh, wound up getting kind of uh, the siren song of English literature took me away from that. Uh, so when I arrived in Vermont, I started, I started paying attention to, OK, where, where am I now? Uh, I'm in a state that elects hardly anything but Republicans. But the very fall that I arrived in Vermont was Bernie Sanders' first gubernatorial um, run on, as a Liberty Union candidate. So I started paying attention and then was thinking about, well, what, what happened here during that time? Uh, how did people react to these, to the strong anti-communist hysteria that was all over the country? Um, I found two very uh, like-minded people. Uh, one was Michael Sherman, who had just shown up in Vermont to lead the Vermont Historical Society in the late 80s. And another one was uh, our mutual friend, Richard Hathaway, professor first at Goddard and then at the Vermont uh, Adult Degree Program. And the three of us kind of hatched this plan to uh, put on this conference just in the, uh, uh, not having any kind of crusade in mind, but rather let's uh, find out what happened here. There were its title again. Uh, Vermont in the McCarthy era. That, that was, and enough people who were involved were still alive at that time. Uh, William Hinton, for instance, was our keynote speaker. So the conference ended. It was very successful. But over the years, I kept thinking, we've only scratched the surface. And maybe when I re retire, I'll do a little more exploration. Um, I went back through the conference booklet, and I, I had reprinted a lot of uh, headlines from local papers. Since one of my jobs on the conference was to put together the, the conference booklet. And there was a headline uh, about Owen Lattimore and Bethel. And I said, gee, we never did anything with that. And uh, well, that'll be a good place to start. And I went back to the library after all those years, all the, back to the microfiche machines. And that resulted in an article for Vermont History, the journal of the uh, Vermont Historical Society. And that's what kind of started this, this ball rolling. I've just been aware for a few years that um, even though bits and pieces of the story are available, um, nobody has yet done a comprehensive look at this time, this place. And, um, and, there, we and there we have it, yes. All right, um, just for the heck of it, let's jump ahead for a moment. 
before we slice and dice your book, go ahead and draw me a political line, if you will, if you can, between the so-called rocked-ribbed republicanism of Vermont in the late 40s and 50s, which you describe quite thoroughly in your book, and that same line, say three, year, three decades later, uh, that includes an avowed socialist like Bernie Sanders, elected and re-elected to represent Vermont and Washington, D.C. That's a strange, squiggly <laughs> line, but give yeah. me a little sense of, in, you know, three or four minutes, yeah, what that yeah, line looks yeah. like in your mind. Well, this was one of the fascinating things about the book, seeing what that, how that, you know, Bernie did not come out of nowhere. And um, people talk about Vermont being rock rib Republican, and uh, it makes a nice image. But the fact is, and I'm generalizing a lot here, um, is that in the um, 30s, 40s, and 50s, there's basically two wings of the Republican Party in Vermont. The Democrats never had a chance of winning any office. But the Republicans were quite split, and for convenience sake, they were called the Proctor Wing and the Gibson Wing, or the Gibson Aiken Wing. Um, and um, the the Proctor Wing, uh, you know, Proctor is the big name down in uh, Rutland in the uh, the mining uh, I industry down there. Uh, very. Uh, Business-minded, very conservative, uh, tending towards uh, right-wing republicanism. And on the other hand, there was Gibson and Aiken, who were <laughs> could have been easily mistaken for New Deal Democrats. Mm -hmm. They supported many of uh, the programs of the New Deal. Um, boy, Republicans like that are few and far between these days. Um, so, um, they, uh, Vermont was a very Republican state, but it was not necessarily a conservative Republican state. Exhibit A would be Ralph Flanders, who is seemingly the very picture of a conservative Republican businessman, uh, but he is the one who decided that McCarthy, McCarthy's tactics were very offensive, and, and if well, by golly, if nobody else is going to do it, I'm going to do it. Um, so uh, there was enough pushback against the uh, hysteria of the time. And a Democrat in southern Vermont named William Meyer saw an opening. And uh, he's in the book, by the yeah, way. Yes, so we have a whole chapter on William Meyer, who became in 1958 the very first Democrat to be elected to the U.S. Congress in 104 years. In Vermont. <laughs> in Vermont. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. Um, now, William Meyer, uh, after he lost his reelection bid and lost several other bids uh, for Senate, um, was one of the founders of the Liberty Union, along with Bernie. He, Meyer got very disenchanted with the Democratic parties attitudes towards the Vietnam War and said, this democratic establishment is not going to do the job. We need a third party. And that's where Bernie enters the picture. I think the, the, uh, the ground was very fertile. So that's, that's sort of it in a nutshell. And it all passed through Mr. Meyer. <clears throat> Bennington, I believe, or Manchester? Yeah, uh, Be Bennington area, a yeah. teeny, teeny yeah. town called West Rippert. Have you been through West Rippert? It's, uh, I blinked. It's I pretty it. small. <laughs> uh, all right, well, let's get back to Vermont again. In the late 1940s and 50s, uh, set the table for us and discuss the, the national anti-communist campaign, the so-called Red Scare that eventually leaked into Vermont politics. Give me, again, a very quick overview of the primary strategic national drivers for the Red Scare, and ultimately the launch of McCarthyism a couple of years later. Well, the uh, end of World War II saw the collapse of the 
alliance between the United States and the Soviet Union. And uh, as the Soviet Union started making its advances in Eastern Europe, uh, all, by the way, agreed to by the, uh, the Yalta Conference um, that, the, uh, that the Soviets would have a sphere of control in the countries that they occupied. Um, but there had been a strain of anti-communism in America ever since the Russian Revolution. Uh, witness what historians refer to as the first Red Scare, which was like 1919 and 1920, when they were rounding up anarchists and radicals like Emma Goldman. Um, at this time, Vermont had a, uh, our sole congressional representative was um, very much an uh, outspoken anti-communist, Charles Plumley of Northfield. Also featured in the book. Yeah. Um, and uh, so just uh, on the uh, other end of the spectrum from Bernie, the seeds had been planted in, in Vermont and, and nationwide that when the U.S. and USSR alliance collapsed, there was a lot of fear about communist influence abroad and also subversion from within. And just in those years, right after the war, there was uh, Harry Truman, under pressure from Republicans, instituting a loyalty oath program in all throughout government because he didn't want to be called soft on communism. And he was known as a liberal Democrat. Yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, in the fall of 1947, there was the, uh, the hearings on Hollywood that re resulted in the Hollywood blacklist. And, um, and one of the big national, interna international events was the communists, led by the Soviet Union, taking over the government of Czechoslovakia, because that sort of that was not in the that was not in the plan. Um, so uh, one of the first chapters in the book has to do with Henry Wallace, who was had been FDR's vice president from um, forty to forty four. And uh, Wallace was getting very disillusioned with post-war U.S. policy. And he ran in 1948 as a third party candidate. And uh, one of my chapters is about the Wallace campaign in Vermont. And uh, here's a headline from the Times. This is the Burlington Daily News when uh, the artist Rockwell Kent came to speak in Burlington in favor of so Henry Wallace. Rockwell Kent welcomes aid for Wallace from commies. Um, so that's, that, that's an indication of the tenor of the times. Right. Um, so anyway, uh, nationwide anti-communist hysteria and you know finding little uh, fissures in Vermont to uh, spread out. Well, that word fissures leads to my next question. Uh, what about that leakage into Vermont of this hysteria? Uh, when exactly did it first appear? And who, who in Vermont got publicly smacked first, uh -huh. maybe second, maybe third? <laughs> Give me a few names of who got it. Well, originally this book was going to be subtitled Vermont and the McCarthy Era, 1948 to 1960, because from what I learned, that the first uh, evidence of all this was the Henry Wallace campaign and how in the, specifically the Burlington Daily News and the Burlington Free Press were so anti-Wallace. Um, and the, uh, the Daily News especially went after a, um, one of the deans at Linden State Teachers College named Luther McNair, who gave a speech endorsing Wallace and uh, um, advocating peace with the Soviet Union. They went after him so viciously that uh, he wound up resigning. Mm 
and they being the the Daily News Burlington and Daily, Daily News under Loeb. And yes, so let's Loeb. back up. Uh, the Daily News was owned by William H. Loeb, who in later years was very well known for running the Manchester Union Leader in New Hampshire, but not. Many people know, and it was a surprise to me, that he got his start in Vermont, uh, first with the St. Albans Messenger, and then with the Burlington Daily News. Um, so uh, they led a campaign against this man, uh, Luther McNair, and were basically in their articles threatening to put pressure on the State Board of Education, and he resigned. Um, before things got too heavy. Um, so anyway, that was going to be my first chapter in 1948. Um, and then I discovered in 1946 that um, Congressman Plumley, uh, who had fended off many different primary opponents over the years, uh, had a true serious challenger uh, Andrew S. Newquist, Andrew E. Newquist. I have to se se separate that because uh, Andrew Newquist's son, Andrew S. Newquist, is a longtime Montpelierite. Mm -hmm. and was very helpful to me in uh, putting this chapter together. Anyway, Professor Newquist, who he was a political science professor at the University of Vermont, announced that he was going to run against Plumlee and uh, was attacked by Plumlee and several other newspapers, of course, the Daily News among them, for uh, being a communist leaning and a New Deal supporting, and uh, the knives really came out for him. So he had to constantly be defending himself, saying, I'm not a communist, I'm not a communist sympathizer, and he, he did pretty well, but he could not beat Plumlee. Um, so um, he was one and done, right? Yeah, one and done, and then uh, Plumlee won one more uh, re-election campaign and then retired. He had a, a role at Norwich University. As he had know. been the president of Nor. He was first a uh, legislator from Northfield, then president of uh, Norwich. Then I think his first run for Congress was 1934. Mm -hmm just before we were born. Uh, <laughs> the, the episodes of anti-communist witch hunts in Vermont that you examine, clearly, many of them do at any rate, have their origins in national politics. Mm. For example, um, Professor Alex Novikov, uh, his firing at UVM in 1954, began many years earlier with uh, two anti-communist witch hunts that uh, turned his name up, one in New York State uh, and one in the, with the Jenner Committee out of Washington. Uh, did you root out any episodes of uh, a witch hunt that was purely, to bring it to the present, locally grown? Mm -hmm. um, someone who was not fingered first by a D.C. Con congressional committee, but originated right here in Vermont? Well, um, you know, there were, the, there were national resonances with the Wallace campaign. I mean, you could say that the uh, campaign against Luther McNair by the Daily News was Vermont grown, but it had its origins in what McNair was saying about national politics. Um, same thing with uh, Andrew Newquist. Um, and the um, episode that happened in Bethel was an interesting one because there was a local woman in Bethel named Lucille Miller who had kind of taken it upon herself um, to be an exposer of uh, communist domination and the infiltration, and, uh, et cetera. And she was uh, feeding a, a national columnist for the Hearst newspapers, Westbrook Pegler. Uh, another funny headline. Here's a, here's a column from Westbrook Pegler, 1950. Vermont Yankees are suckers for commies. 
Um, but and this was fed to him. Yeah. The, the my, new content was fed to him by, by Ms. Miller. Man, yeah. Mrs. Miller. Uh, and Mrs. Miller was trying to get uh, attention to the fact that in Randolph Center, there were a group of people who had summer homes who were in the uh, circle in Washington, D.C. that included Alger Hiss. Um, there were um, uh, labor lawyers, and um, there, there were like five different families. And she said, you have to go to Randolph Center with a, you can go there with a butterfly net. They're all over the place. <laughs> Um, so when uh, Owen Lattimore was going to buy a summer home in Bethel and then got named by McCarthy as the top spy in the State Department, incidentally, this was a big surprise to Lattimore since he didn't work in the State Department <laughs> and spent many, many years fighting this charge in court. Um, so that brought national attention to Vermont. Um, although the, the story was locally uh, manufactured. Uh, before you uh, describe other episodes, uh, and we get deeper into the uh, situation, tell us about the Vermont lay of the land, uh, both the mainstream political power structure, which you touched on when you talked about the different wings of the Republican Party, and the mainstream landscape, and the land of hard week, hard working people who were uh, pay, who were paying attention. Mm -hmm. uh, but first, show us a few more of those newspaper mm -hmm. articles. That show us what Vermonters were seeing in their daily papers. <clears throat> well, here's a headline from uh, the Rutland Herald. What's it say? Um, Flanders moved to oust McCarthy, sent to committee. Uh, Joseph McCarthy and Ralph Flanders were on the front page of Vermont newspapers seemingly every day from March 54 till September 54 when the censure vote was mm -hmm. taken. Um, and uh, when William Hinton was called in front of the Senate Internal uh, Security Committee in 1954, here was a headline from the Free Press. Vermont farmer cites Fifth Amendment when questioned on red status. At the time, yes, William Hinton was, a, he was a farmer. He was farming in Putney. He was living in Vermont. But the fact is, he had just returned uh, after uh, six years in red China. Um, so he wasn't any old Vermont farmer. <laughs> He was on the FBI's A-list. <laughs> yes, he certainly was. Uh, but that's a whole other story. Um, so you mentioned that they were daily exposed to these headlines, reminding them of the national drama playing out. In your hundreds of hours of research, <laughs> through microfiche machines, uh, from quite a number of newspapers, Tell me about what you might have seen in the um, letters to the editor sections. Yeah. Is there a robust give and take there? I would say yes. Um, the fact is that people were, uh, depending upon the newspaper, people in general were not afraid of expressing strong opinions uh, against McCarthy. Um, or against uh, McCarthy's uh, persecution of Owen Lattimore, um, even though the Vermont Daily News, the Burlington Daily News and the Burlington Free Press, which was a conservative paper but not quite as uh, yeah, headline hunting as the, the Daily News, um, you know, those stood out as the as the more right wing of the Vermont papers, but uh, Robert Mitchell writing in the Rutland Herald, John Drysdale, the White River Valley Herald, out of Randolph, and I have a whole chapter on Bernard O'Shea, um, who was first in Swanton and then in Enosburg Falls. Um, these people were pulling no punches in their editorials. 
and um, and people were responding. You know, I would say it was a, it, it was at least one to one the pro and con. And uh, as soon as Flanders got into the act, there were many more letters supporting Flanders than uh, being against him. So um, there's one thing I didn't quite manage to get into the book. Um, a graduate student at Columbia University in 1954 did his doctoral thesis on taking a sampling of um, opinions about McCarthy in Bennington and, um, and showed that um, on the one hand people liked his aims but disapproved of his methods. Uh, there were all kinds of ways to read the uh, statistics that he got. But um, I think there was uh, more pushback in Vermont than there may have been in other places nationally. And it, you know, it helped that if uh, Ralph Flanders was, uh, was out there, that people felt, well, if our senator is saying these things, then maybe it's not so bad if I say these things. Rick, uh, I recall reading in uh, one of your chapters that uh, William Loeb was famously uh, biased, of course, <clears throat> from page editorials, but he also, uh, so you re reported, uh, famously edited out letters to the editor that um, contradicted their editorial position. Do I have that right? Is that I, I, I've, never got, I've never got a <clears throat> hard and fast answer on that. Okay. You know, it was hard to find that the the Daily News did not print nearly as many letters as the Herald, the Brattleboro Reformer. You know, you could count on seeing a letter to the editor every day in those papers, not in the Daily News. And of Chittenden County, no less. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> At the time, one of the most populous counties in the state. Yeah. Um, all right. <clears throat> now. Let's take a look at the pushback that you mentioned earlier. Uh, one of the testimonials for your book came from Tony Hiss, Alger Hiss's son, who wrote The View from Alger's Window. Mm -hmm. uh, he stated in the blurb they submitted supporting your book that your book, quote, recreates the little known story of how valiant Vermonters rallied to withstand the pressures and distortions of the McCarthy era. Close quote. Uh, give me a few more examples of the valiant pushback mm -hmm. from Vermonters that uh, you un unearthed. Uh, first, a little word about Tony Hiss. Um, of course, the son of Alger Hiss, who was famously accused of being a Soviet spy, not convicted of that. He was convicted for perjury and went to jail for two years. And while he was in jail, um, Tony Hiss, who was like seven or eight at the time, because the Hiss family had a summer place in Peachum, Vermont, was sent to um, stay with friends there. And he, in, in this uh, memoir called The View from Alger's Window, which recounts that his how he was able to maintain his relationship with his father while mm -hmm. his father was in jail. But he talks very eloquently about the just good old ordinary folks in Peachum who liked the family and took him in and gave him a kind of a measure of sanity mm -hmm. uh, that, that let him have a somewhat normal childhood. Also, he went to as an adolescent went to Putney School. She also credits a lot. But the pushback, um, you know, on one hand we had Senator Flanders, the, the most prominent of Vermont politicians, uh, taking on McCarthy and um, saying, I am, I am offended by your behavior and your methods. 
and you're ruining it for the real anti-communists like me. <laughs> um, down to the newspaper editors, like uh, I'm thinking specifically of John Drysdale, who when McCarthy was slandering Owen Lattimore, did expose after expose of uh, what, what the real story was. And at a certain point, Drysdale realized he only had a weekly with a very small circulation. So he talked to his friends, Robert Mitchell at the Rutland Herald and John Hooper at the, at the Brattleboro Reformer. And um, they f kind of formed a consortium to get a very well-respected journalist from New York to come up and investigate and do a six-part series that ran on the front page of both the Reformer and the Herald every day for a week that summer. And uh, that, you know, went a long way to saying, we don't do things like that here. Mm -hmm. you know? So that was nice to see. Uh, somebody else who was uh, very outspoken about these things and um, she needs some good PR these days, is uh, Dorothy Canfield Fisher, a really amazing person and who uh, lived in Arlington and wrote a book called Vermont Traditions. And uh, <clears throat> she quoted a neighbor of hers in the book um, because people were always accusing the communists of trying to bore from within. And uh, her neighbor said, anybody who tries to bore from within and Vermont is going to hit granite. <laughs> <laughs> that ends <laughs> that. <boring. laughs> um, and uh, I have a little uh, article in there uh, about uh, people who uh, started a summer camp for children of uh, people who were under suspicion uh, nationally who could send their kids to uh, uh, camp in Vermont in the summer and not be, not be bothered and let their parents deal with crises at home. You didn't have to go to that camp, did you? No. <laughs> I, you didn't, I didn't even know about it. Eligible. <laughs> um, all right, let's, uh, looking back, to the eventual Vermont fallout from that nefarious time. Do you believe the Vermont, that Vermont finally fell in line, as it were? Did we eventually, even after McCarthy died, uh, and McCarthyism faded a bit, did we succumb to the national anti-communist Cold War militaristic fervor? Or, uh, Yeah, it's a, it, and, and lastly, on that note, did you unearth any continuing efforts after the McCarthyism climax um, to purge, investigate teachers, trade unionists in Vermont as sort of the mm -hmm. residual effect of all that? Yeah. Well, uh, uh, second part first. Um, just you know, in 1971. Um, the history professor Michael Parenti was fired from University of Vermont for being a little too politically outspoken in his classes. It was perfectly echoing the Novikov case of uh, 20 years earlier where the faculty votes one thing and the trustees say, uh-uh, out he goes. So that happened to not only Parenti but uh, four or five other UVM professors. Um, Bernie Sanders was uh, continually red baited in one way or another. Whether he was took his honeymoon in Russia, you know, when he got married, or whether he spoke in favor of the Cuban Revolution, mm -hmm. um, and uh, so people were even people in the Democratic Party uh, who were in the Burlington all their. Alderman, you know, the, whatever that council is called, were uh, saying, you know, the socialists are going to take over Burlington. We can't have this. 
they uh, lost. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, I think w w it's hard to generalize and about any political era that it's one thing or another. And what's fascinating about this period in Vermont is that um, there was acquiescence sometimes. Uh, there was that falling in line, and there was pushback sometimes. And um, there is, on the whole, more pushback than acquiescence, which is which is certainly not the case in New Hampshire, mm -hmm. where it was. Um, they had an attorney general who wanted to be a little McCarthy, and Loeb re really had his headquarters by that time set up in Manchester. Um, there is, by the way, a full chapter on the New Hampshire reality in his book. Yeah, it's very instructive to see what happened in New Hampshire that didn't happen in Vermont and vice versa. Uh, and it really gives a lot of fodder to uh, all the historians and philosophers who say there's a there's a real difference between philosophically, aesthetically, you mm -hmm. know, whatever. Um, so I'm I'm reluctant to say yes, we did this or no, we didn't do that. Um, and you know to. Uh, it must have been very difficult for people in Burlington 1953 to come forward publicly and support Alex Novikov. You know, there, there were people who did that. And I have a chapter on um, Novikov's chief defender at, the, at, U, at UVM who never lost his bitterness about how his friend was treated there. I remember <clears throat> reading about your um, uh, uh, Wallace campaign chapter that he came to Vermont, <clears throat> came to Burlington, uh, and had an awfully difficult time uh, getting set up for his uh, whistle stop tour. In fact, the um, uh, Loeb newspaper, the Burlington Daily News, uh, captured the uh, guess the list of who attended this, and, and lightly who, attended. And who gave him money. Who gave him money and how much and published it. Um, so it was perilous times to, in Burlington, certainly with the Daily News right there, to come out even for a nationally recognized presidential candidate yeah. uh, who was once a vice president. Uh, all right. Uh, Someone once said, and correct me if I got this wrong, I think it was Kurt Vonnegut, <clears throat> that um, history doesn't repeat itself, but it sure as hell rhymes. That is a great quote. I have never heard that, and I'm, it sounded like something Kurt Vonnegut would say. Right. Did you check Google on that? <laughs> uh, I try to avoid <laughs> Google whenever possible. Um, so what have we learned, if anything, about resisting those quote, four horsemen of calumny, fear, ignorance, bigotry, and smear that Maine Senator Margaret Trace Smith mentioned in 1950. Yeah, another forthright Republican. <clears throat> mm -hmm. uh, especially now that social media plays such huge roles in fueling those four horsemen. Uh, and especially, and I'm gonna pull up another quote from a blurb, uh, and especially as Joe Sherman wrote, Quote, the nasty, life-tearing, reputation-ruining, anti-commie campaign of 70 years ago has many similarities to what we're being swept along in with the Trump administration. As I'm sure some of Winston's characters thought or said, this can't happen here. <laughs> it can <laughs> and will if the momentum that the Republican nation, Republicans nationwide are now riding like power drunk horsemen of the apocalypse is not brought to a halt. Mm -hmm. That's um, quite a colorful quote. Yeah. Um, is history rhyming, Rick? Mm, yeah. By the way, uh, Joe Sherman is a terrific writer and um, his book about Vermont politics from 1940 to 1970 
go fast lane on a dirt road is uh, um, I, I have used that book and hopefully turned a lot of people onto it. Um, you know, uh, another quote occurred to me as you were quoting Vonnegut, um, who said it, I don't know, but uh, something to the effect of uh, a lie is halfway around the world before the truth can put on its boots. <laughs> Uh, and and so things are, you know, the, the the news cycle is so much faster that if somebody is accused of something these days, it's uh, it's a very dangerous situation, and there is a lot of accusation going around and fear mongering. Uh, one of the big uh, aha moments for me was when. I realized that there, there was a direct line between what's happening today and back then. Uh, it came out during the presidential campaign in 2016 that uh, Donald Trump's mentor in New York State, in New York City uh, real estate, uh, the social world, his mentor was Rory Cohn, who had been McCarthy's right hand man and uh, destroyer of many reputations. And uh, all of a sudden it all made, made a certain terrible kind of sense to me that, you know, there's, who would want Donald Trump as a protege and who would want Roy Cohn as a mentor? So mm -hmm. there you go. Cohn um, does rhyme with Cohn. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, it's a little dangerous to get into specifics now because, you know, we're doing this interview on Valentine's Day, February 2018, and um, Trump might be gone by the time the, this book comes out. Who knows? But the forces that Trump has unleashed are not going anywhere. And I think we are seeing a fear-mongering that does have a parallel in the McCarthy era. The fear of the other, those people are gonna come over and take away what we have. Um, and uh, telling blatant untruths and um, smearing people, uh, calling them names, um, without regard for, you know, McCarthy didn't have any sense of propriety himself. He was constantly making up belittling nicknames for the people in the Senate who'd- Boy, that who, rings a bell. Who, uh, who disagreed does that? with him. Uh. Yeah, so, um, and we have, uh, you know, we have a situation where people say, am I gonna stick out my neck? against the immigration agents and protect this family who's going to get taken away? Uh, or am I going to do something about cutting all this funding for whatever helpful program you could name? You know, I think people are um, asking themselves these days, uh, how much am I willing to put myself out there? Uh, seeing that the atmosphere in this country mm -hmm. has changed so much so quickly. Um, so anyway, hopefully this this book has some lessons for that. We look at the examples of people like John Drysdale and Bernard O'Shea and and uh, and uh, Bernard O'Shea had a an editorial in 1950 that's that was labeled this silly hysteria. And he talked about an incident that's been repeated many times. Uh, you know, somebody in a pu very public place having a clipboard with the Bill of Rights saying, will you sign this petition? Mm -hmm. and, uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> and that's what, you know, there is a, uh, a kind of a fear of Keep your head down. Don't say anything. And don't and get on a list. Yeah, don't get on a list. So that's, that's what we have to be fighting these days.
Well, I have to warn you that you're, um, you just made a headline that is probably halfway around the world by now, which is that um, Vermont author, author claims that Trump will be gone within six months. <laughs> um, Stranger things have happened, let's put it that way. Uh, before I ask you the, the, a little what's next for you, um, having done these nine compelling stories, which one at the end of the day, do you think about most? Hmm. I am still really drawn to um, the Bethel and Randolph episode with Owen Lattimore's uh, involvement because it it had the most it had the most strands. Um, this is the Lucy Miller, the Lucille uh, Miller chapter, yeah. yes, um, and that it, it involved a very um, local event that all of a sudden became national very quickly. It, it had the local people who said, "How can we get the truth out quickly?" And it had an absolutely fascinating ca cast of characters we haven't mentioned yet. Um, the guy who started it all in Bethel, who was uh, a well-known Arctic explorer named Wilhelm Stephenson, uh, who was a summer resident in Bethel who sold some land to Owen Lattimore. Um, and uh, Lattimore brought his friends who were escaping the uh, Chinese communists uh, from Mongolia. So there was a whole Mongolian contingent that was in Bethel. The story really screwed up the FBI investigators <laughs> opening mail <laughs> written in Mongolian. <laughs> in fact, a very early iteration in my mind about this book was that maybe maybe that chapter could be mm -hmm. could, could in essence be the whole book. But I, I think this uh, serves a better purpose. Mm -hmm. um, so, what is next for you, Rick? Um, one of your blog posts that I saw, um, by the way, if you want to get to the blog post, um, just Google, oh, I mentioned that dirty word, um, Red Scare in Vermont, or Rick Winston, Red Scare, and you'll get right to um, your blog and other postings Which from hasn't you. hasn't really started yet. <laughs> Needs work. It's a work in progress. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, I saw someone had written a little note there to you. Um, Someday, quote, someday I'll tell you my father's story. Yes. Surely in your travels you've encountered uh, a lot of people with stories to tell. Yeah. Uh, are you going to begin collecting more stories and passing them along? Or are you um, going to um, uh, wrap up your briefcase and, and rest for a while? Truthfully, I haven't thought that far ahead. Okay. But it is great, uh, and I and I'm sure once this book will start circulating, I will start hearing more and more of these stories. In fact, I got a call out of the blue from an author in New York who is doing a memoir about her father, and sh she did the same thing. She just typed in. Red Scare of Vermont and came up with mm -hmm. me. <laughs> uh, she has been trying to find out information that family legend has it that uh, her father was named as a communist by Loeb mm -hmm. on the front page of the Daily News, Burlington Daily News, and he had to resign his post in Vermont and move the family to New Jersey. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, I couldn't help her. and short of going in those microfiche machines going through every day right. of the Berlin Daily News in 1954 and 55. Uh, but I am sure I'm going to hear a lot more of those stories. And um, I've included in the book as a, um, an overview at the beginning an essay that Richard Hathaway wrote for a 1988 conference. And um, he was kind of setting the stage for this is what was happening nationally and internationally. And he was writing in 18, 1988, 
the legacy of McCarthy and McCarthyism uh, is still unfolding. And those very words could be mm -hmm. written today. So um, the book is by no means a definitive uh, picture of the times because I can well imagine meeting people who tell me stories and say, oh, if I had only known, I would have, <laughs> <laughs> that would have been chapter 10 or whatever. But the you sequel. gotta stop somewhere. <laughs> um, well, you're not going to be stopping because you have a book now coming out in July. Again, that's Rootstock Publishing in Montpelier. And uh, how are you going to get the message out? Are you gearing yourself for a, a, a book tour, book promotion, speaking engagements, radio interviews? Um, are you going to do all that? Uh, oh, most of the above. Fortunately, Vermont is a small enough state, so we could say, well, this bookstore and that mm -hmm. bookstore, and the, you know, it's it's doable. Um, there's only a few overnight stops. Uh, I don't know if you remember the great New York Times columnist Russell Baker. Oh, I love Russell yeah, Baker. He wrote a, a fantastic column imagining uh, Mark Twain and Herman Melville meeting each other in the airport on their on their respective book tours. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't think I'll be flying anywhere, but um, you know I'm hoping to. Uh, there, there are now at least three book festivals in Vermont, uh, maybe more for all I know, and uh, and and hopefully, um, you know, there the the story will get beyond the Vermont borders, and and people are saying, oh, that sounds interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly classes in the 50s yeah. in colleges and universities around the country should take note of this book. Mm -hmm. We'll probably, it'll cross their desk at least. If they don't order five, 50 copies, <laughs> they'll at least know about it. Yeah. Um, well, very good. Uh, Rick Winston, author of Red Scare in the Green Mountains, Vermont in the McCarthy area, era, 1946 to 1960. I'm Jim Higgins, and thank you all for listening. Thank you, Jim.